afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the press conference for A Dangerous Method. We're going to get underway shortly, but first just a few housekeeping notes to keep things running smoothly. When we bring the cast out, there'll be about 90 seconds of flash photography with the cast standing, and then we'll ask the photographers to please move back, and please keep the sides in the center aisle clear to make room for our volunteers so that they can move around with the microphones for questions. Uh, media, please stand and identify yourself and your media outlet before asking questions. Please make sure all mobile phones are off. And today's press conference will be streamed live on www.tiff.net slash festival. And now it's my pleasure to bring out the director, screenwriter, producer, and the cast of the film, A Dangerous Method, as well as our moderator, Henri Behar. While photographers are at it, uh, let me remind you, or give you a few, whoa. Once they're done, if you have a question that you wish to ask to any of the panelists, please raise your hand a little bit ahead of time. Aha, thank you. Raise your hand a little bit ahead of time so we can see you. So more importantly, uh, the microphone could be given you. Once you have the microphone, please stand up, introduce yourselves, ask your question, and then give the mic back. Thanks. Okay, photographers, please, thank you very much. And if you must operate during the press conference, please do not use your flashes, because it would interfere with the work of the camera of the television folks. Hello, everyone, and uh, welcome to the press conference for A Dangerous Method. And I will introduce the panelists uh, to the suite, um, and I will probably start with the person with whom this whole adventure began, uh, from the writer, playwright, who wrote The Talking Cure, on which the film is based, Mr. Christopher Hampton. Uh, one of the two titans in the affrontement between Freud and Young is with us, as Sigmund Freud, Mr. Viggo Mortensen. Um, sitting next to him, possibly the cipher of the, of the piece, far less known than Freud and Jung, uh, Sabina, who went from a patient to a pioneer in child psychology, Ms. Kira Knightley. As the suffering but strong wife of Carl Jung, Ms. Sarah Gadin, I checked the pronunciation. Leave span. Uh, all the way at the end, uh, the producer of the film, Mr. Jeremy Thomas, and center, of course, director David Cronenberg. And I will throw the first question at you, Mr. Hampton. Much has been written about Freud and about Jung. Very little is known about Sabina Spielrein. How did you find about her? Uh, <coughs> it's like a Victorian novel. Uh, in the 70s, a suitcase was found in an attic in Geneva, which contained uh, um, her diaries, several letters to Jung and to Freud, uh, several writings, psychoanalytic writings that she'd. Uh, and this, you know. She disappeared because she'd been killed by the Nazis in 1942. 
And so it was a, an Italian psychoanalyst called Caro Tenuto who wrote a book called A Secret, Serum, a Secret Symmetry, uh, which I came across, in, I guess, in the 80s. Um, but but the, the real uh, breakthrough for me was um, I befriended the curator of the Jung Museum in the Burg Hölzli Hospital in Zurich. Um, and at a certain point, he said to me, um, who is this patient that you're interested in? I said, she's called Sabina Spielrein. He said, have you any idea when she was admitted? I said, well, you know, roughly 17th of August, 1904. And he said, uh, I'm locking up the museum now. Come down to the basement. Uh, and in the basement was the hospital archive. And he took a black ledger off the shelves. And it was the case notes of Sabina Spielrein. Uh, were written, typed by Jung with his handwritten um, remarks in the margin. It was absolute gold dust. Uh, and I, s I said, but, you know, it's all in German. There's quite a lot of it. He said, well, you've got half an hour and there's a photocopier in the corner. So that was the start of the whole, the whole thing for me. And, um, and I, 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 I really wanted to, one of the things I wanted to do was to bring her back into prominence, really, because she was a remarkable woman. Uh, who um, had a, you know, an exemplary career and actually w had a lot of input into the ideas of both, both Jung and Freud. So, um, so that was you know, one of the, one of the uh, initial motives for writing the thing in the first place. Ms. Taxi, did you do any kind of sp specific and parallel research about the character as Mr. Hampton may have done? Yes, as soon as I knew that I was going to play the part, um, I phoned Christopher and said, help. Um, and he said, all right, come round. And uh, I thought that he was going to give me a talk for about a couple of hours and I'd take notes, which he did, but he also sort of handed me a pile of books that was about that big and just said, read all of those. And uh, it's somewhere in there. So I did that and then um, and found a translation of, of the diaries and Jung's notes, which were very helpful. Um, and then spoke to a couple of analysts as well, just to kind of get an idea from them of, of what exactly hysteria was and where it would come from. Question from the audience. The gentleman here in the middle. If you could give the mic. Over there. Yes. It is a gentleman, isn't it? I'm sorry. <laughs> Henri, it's Andrea Case, CTV News. Um, after doing a film like this, specifically for, I guess for all of you, uh, have you ever thought about uh, as seeing a psychologist, a psychiatrist? Is this something that uh, um, a lot of people have a negative thought about mental illness? And I know this isn't specifically just about mental illness, but have you thought about seeing someone after this? Um, what are your thoughts on that? I just go back to work with David, and he kind of firms up all my neuroses, <laughs> gets them all fit and ready to go out and do damage. Yes? You, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, of course. Ma'am? You have been actually uh, from Lord of the Rings to writing in Lord of the <laughs> now is Freud. Amazing. What I wanted to know, how did, how did you research your character and whether you agree with Freud's theory? Do I agree with his theory? Yeah, yeah. Do you share, do you share his theory? What do you think about it, your own opinion? Um, well, I would say that I think in the hands of another director who was less assured, uh, less knowledgeable, less well-read uh, about the subject matter, about both Freud and Jung and and uh, Spielrein, uh, it would have been a, a very dull movie, I think. And uh, you know, someone who had felt the pressure all the time of making an important movie about an import important subject. Uh, and I, I think that the best thing that David uh, did, which is what I've experienced always with him, is that he instills confidence by creating a calm, professional and fun atmosphere on the set. You know, he you know, gets you under a spell and creates the illusion that there's plenty of time, there's no pressure, and it's all gonna work out. And 
you know, that I think that th the movie works because it doesn't get bogged down in trying to be academic. It is academic, it's well researched, you know, based on the, the work that, uh, about Spielan and Freud and Jung, using the letters <coughs> largely between them. Uh, you know, Christopher wrote an excellent script. The academic value is there. The purpose is to tell an entertaining story in the end, you know, a movie that is fun to watch, that's interesting to watch, that makes you want to learn more about maybe the period, about these people, and that's, that's what I focused on. I, I think that there's plenty of material here if you're a fanatical follower of Jung to be upset about and maybe to be slightly pleased about, and the same for followers of, of Freud and, and those who maybe wanted to see Spielrein vindicated, but that's not really the most important thing. That's not what I took from the experience of shooting it, much as I enjoyed doing the research. Uh, in the end, it wasn't about academic differences, it was about personality differences and misunderstandings, things that can happen anywhere at any time. That's what's dramatically interesting uh, about it. So I'm, I'm just gonna dodge the question. <laughs> 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 because I don't think it goes to the heart of the matter. Hi, this is Linda from Fairchild TV of Toronto. Welcome to Toronto. This question is to Kiera. You have played a lot of different roles, you know, in different films. This film is more frantic and fanatic. What is the challenge and how you craft this art? Thank you. Um, I think it, it, it was a very, it is a very challenging role. Um, I think that was one of the reasons that I really wanted to play her because I, I didn't, I didn't know who she was. You know, I think very often when you play characters, there are certain threads that uh, that sort of link you. You know, emotionally, you can understand exactly what the person went through. With this one, I had, I had no frame of reference, but that was what was fascinating and exciting about it. So it really was, you know, a question of trying to find logic within what was perceived from the outside to be madness, because I think as, as much as she knew that she was ill, there were logical reasons within her for the way that she behaved. So it was really trying to understand exactly what, what that logic was and, and, and then sort of find out from the inside and, and build her up. And, you know, it was with the help of David um, here, you know, we, we managed to craft something together. So, and it was, it was a very exciting process. Ma'am? This is our beauty moment. I'm Janine Falcon from L'Oreal Paris. <laughs> Kira, I have a question for you. You've played characters in a range of eras. Um, is there a beauty era that uh, calls to you where you think, I could really spend some time looking like this? No. <laughs> <laughs> No, not really. You know, I mean, I, I do. Um, I, I find that a very exciting part of my job to kind of look at the different uh, styles from different centuries. You know, I find that part of creating a character. I love working with wonderful costume designers, like we had on this with Denise Cronenberg, who did such a wonderful job. And you know, creating those those dresses and really finding finding a character through clothes and through through the hair and makeup is always a, a fascinating part of my job. Sir, did I dodge that? Hello. For Vigo and Kira, um, do you have someone in particular that you like to share your opinions about the films that you do? Someone and why that they give you some opinions about the work that you do? Someone we can talk to? Yes. Uh, you know, I, yeah. D uh, do you mean do I have people that give me opinions on my work whose opinion I really value? Yes, I do definitely. Who are, who are they? They're a, a, it's, it's definitely a secret, yeah. <laughs> Thanks. For Latin America, I have a question from Kera. Do you think uh, acting is a good therapy? What keeps you grounded as a um, I, I don't know what keeps me grounded. I mean, acting <laughs> as therapy, yes. Um, I, I think a lot of people do say that they use acting as therapy. I, I don't really go for that. I mean, I think that it's incredibly cathartic. And particularly playing a role like this, you know, I think it, it's almost strange what a wonderful time we had making this film. You know, it's, it's particularly my character is very dark and it seems, it seems almost perverse that we had such a wonderful fun time outside that. But I think partly it was due to the fact that you're going to these incredibly dark places, you're trying to think about that and it kind of all comes out in that direction and then afterwards you leave it and you go and watch soccer and have a beer and have a really nice time. 
to do um, <coughs> one in principle, uh, from at least the way I read it, the, the most positive aspect, the initial, the positive aspect of what Freud had a large hand in fathering and pioneering was the idea of <coughs> listening to people in a, in a particular way. And why I say positive, because I think it's one of the most uh, loving things you can do, just to listen to somebody. Um, in principle, the idea was that you're uh, listening to someone confess without judging them. You are, of course, going to judge them in some way, but the, the person that's being listened to, they're not being listened to by a family member or someone who has some emotional stake in what's, what you're telling them. And they're just listening. And I think whether it's you know parent, child, or friends, or lovers, ambassadors at the UN, <laughs> you know, the, if you listen, first of all, that means you're showing some interest in what's going on with them and not just in what's going on with you or your country or your, your interests. And uh, I think that it depends how you approach acting, but to me the best acting and the best directing comes from that. You can prepare everything as much as you want, but in the end when you get there, the foundation of good acting is really listening. Even if you have a lot of dialogue, you know, unless you're just talking to yourself, well then you listen to yourself, I guess. But, <laughs> but to just take that first step and listen and see what, where that takes you, no matter how, what you've planned, you know, is, is positive. And I, I like that aspect of the story we were telling as well. A uh, question about the fourth character of, of, the, of the play and the script. Uh, three of the characters clash overtly and brutally. There's one character who rema that remains completely grounded and avoids any kind of real clash. Was it a different kind of writing, Mr. Hampton? Or was it a different approach for you, Ms. Gadda? She's a really interesting character, Mrs. Jung, and overlooked um, uh, a good deal by, um, by people even who write biographies of Jung. Uh, I think she must have been an extraordinary... I mean, I think the women in this, in this film are, are both extraordinary characters. Uh, she put up with an enormous amount, and she supported him, looked after him all his life. The uh, when the film ends, he's about to go into a five-year nervous breakdown. She saw him through all of that. She gave him five children. Uh, and, um, uh, and I think she's a really interesting character, and I, I, I wish I'd... Y you know, if, if I had it to do again, I might spend more time on her. <laughs> well, I think she was the foundation of his home, and that's, that's for sure. But I think it's interesting that often people interpret my character as submissive, and that's certainly... I didn't say that. Pardon me? I didn't say submissive. No, I know, I know you didn't, but, but people do often interpret Emma as um, submissive, but when I was approaching the character, I never thought of her in that way, ever. And uh, I, I thought that she was really more so the archetypal artist's wife in, in terms of her support and, uh, and her interest in his work. And so I think that that's what I tried to express in the character throughout the film. She also, she wrote an academic book and she became an analyst herself as well. This is something that you, we, we can't really deal with in the movie, but she actually ended up, it seemed that anyone who came in contact with psychoanalysis in those days, ended up being an analyst, <laughs> you know, instead of a patient. It was, a, it was incredibly um, attractive, magnetic kind of uh, profession that, that hadn't existed before and was suddenly accessible to people who I don't think would ever have thought of themselves as being uh, a healer or a physician. Christian, we, sorry. Christian, we were there. With the Canadian press. Uh, first off, for Kira, I was just wondering about the La Fleur jersey that you brought in. I know Vigo is a big Canadian fan. Is that from Vigo? Is he? Yeah, yeah. I, I actually, I have to admit, I have no idea what the jersey is that I was wearing <laughs> earlier. It was entirely, he told me that it would wind David up, so we decided it would be a good idea. And it did wind I you up. I gave her thorough <laughs> coaching back. Thorough coaching, something about a blonde demon. <laughs> I don't know what that means. That was right, right? I told her it was a very perverse yeah. thing to do to wear that jersey here, and she <laughs> it didn't that didn't seem to bother her. Uh, and for Vigo and David, I was wondering about the relationship. 
relationship between you two as actor and director. Um, can you talk about how your relationship has evolved from history of violence to Eastern Promises and now a dangerous method? I think we're done, aren't we? Yeah, I think it's <laughs> <laughs> the last straw. I mean, I'm you go, I basically just say action and cut. I don't really say anything else. It's pretty much it. He goes for a coffee and comes back. I come back and I ask, is, is he finished? Is he finished? <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'd like to go to go to go back to the process of uh, collaborating collaboration between Mr. Hampton and uh, David Cronenberg. If I understand the production notes, you started out writing this piece, Mr. Hampton, as a script before you turned it into a play, and then it went from play to script. So it's kind of an accordion kind of thing. At which point did Mr. Cronenberg come into play to, um, I mean, well, on I'm board to say. open it? I'm delighted to say he contacted me having read the play and not knowing that it had started life as a, as a, as a movie uh, script. And in fact, the, it's interesting that the, f the final film resembles the play more than it, d it does the, the original screenplay, in which I hadn't really managed to focus it properly, I don't think. Yeah, I mean, we just, uh, ultimately we had the play, and then, uh, to my surprise, there w I discovered that there ac actually was a screenplay that existed, and we kind of, we had that material, and, and also different research, and over the over a period of time, I think Christopher had rethought a lot of uh, what he had done, and uh, so we, we, he wrote another screenplay, and we sort of just worked from that. I mean, we didn't really look back at, at any of the other things. That's um, right. Yeah. There's something, uh, you know, it's uh, the one of the things I like a lot about the, the play and the screenplay is that <coughs> the one, you know, you neither Christopher nor David in executing the story and shooting the story tried to make up for or alter the realities of, of the time period in terms of didn't try to make these men less vain, didn't try to make them more um, liberated in their thinking towards women. I mean, it was, you can't separate them from their times, but it is remarkable what they were thinking about, what they, what they originated in their time, but they are, as we all are, you know, products of their time. And, and, and the characters of, you know, Sabina wasn't, you know, she was given some credit by Freud could have given her a lot more credit and could have understood her better. But I think his being a man in that time and his ego maybe got in the way of that because he was capable of understanding her better. He certainly mm, made use of her ideas to some degree, but he did give her a footnote. Jung didn't give her <laughs> any, but I think it was uh, not just their personalities, I don't know what you guys think, but it was also no. that time, you know, men were men and women were doing, you know, it was unusual that she was doing this, Sabina, as a line of work, and extraordinarily intelligent, precocious, whatever you want to call it, but not a man. And also, <coughs> Mrs. Jung, you know, talk about listening, she was very astute, and I think that comes across in the, in the movie. She really watched and listened, and probably was a much better listener than either Freud or Jung. You know, she didn't let her ego get in the way. In the way uh, bo both of them did. You know, and I, I like the fact that it wasn't. You didn't varnish over that. You didn't um, remove the flaws in making a movie from yeah. from the script. Yeah, I think um, for me one of the attractions of doing a biopic uh, was to is resurrection. You know, you you were really trying to bring these people back to life because you would like to see them in action. You'd like them to be alive, um, and to do that in any satisfying satisfying way, you have to be faithful to what they really were and not try to idealize them or, or on the other hand, attack them. But we had no agenda, really. I mean, uh, there's a built-in feminist aspect to the story because of what Sabina was and the repression of women at the time. In fact, hysteria, which is what she suffers from at the beginning of the movie, uh, the word hysteria comes from the Greek word that means uterus. It was like it was meant to be a disease of women that was actually, of course, doesn't exist anymore, but came f out of the repression of women's sexuality and other things at the time. So, uh, so w w in resurrecting the, the the people, 
you also have to resurrect the times in which they existed, which is part of the fun that we had. Yeah, and I was worked from the principle that what really happened uh, is bound to be more interesting than anything you can invent. So the work was really to delve into, you know, what really happened between these three people, four people. And, and um, uh, you said there's nothing invented in the film at all. Uh, and from the moment I found those case notes um, to, to, the, to the time we made the film, um, that the work was really to try to keep as accurate as possible uh, a watch on, you know, and, and you know, to, to see what, what they, what they, how what they did would illuminate, you know, the subject. Question here. Hi, um, I'm Kinda Mardambe from Press Plus One, and I wanted to ask Kira. In the mic. I'm oh sorry. Is this your second production that you've done in Canada, or Canadian production? Second one. Is this my second pr uh, Canadian? Yes, I have done one of the. Silk, right? Yes. Yeah. So I, I was wondering if Canadian films give you uh, a little bit more range. You're allowed to kind of, you know, stretch your acting legs a little bit more. Uh, I think I've been incredibly lucky with the parts that I've played wherever they've come from, whether they've been Canadian or uh, American or English or, or, or anything. You know, I think it's, a, it's about stories. I mean, obviously, I, you have great talent here. You know, I mean, the opportunity to work with David David was, was one that um, I think any actor would, would jump at. So, um, But n no, I don't necessarily know that there's a, a, a national... Um, thing going on? <laughs> yeah, well, you wore the that jersey. Yeah. <laughs> That's a very Canadian thing. You, you know. can get a I mean, it's a Montreal. subversive... Can I? I yeah. think, oh yeah, I'm going to be huge in Montreal after this, so that's good. <laughs> no, but the same question could be extended to Jeremy Thomas. Jeremy Thomas, do you find there's a comp there are differences between the way uh, films are made in Canada, in the United States, in England, in China? You've, tra you've worked everywhere, so... You're in a unique position well, you know, to... The camera, d the camera doesn't know... Well, you don't know what the camera doesn't see. So um, films are made with a group of talent and artists together. And, of course, it's, it's a very... Uh, can Canada has such a healthy film business because it's created an ambience that you can make films um, in sort of freedom and you can, uh, there's an economy here. So on this particular film, uh, I can see two of my, my partners down here, Marco and Marty, um, we worked on a film um, and brought together various systems of financing. So, you know, it's expedient in one way, but of course uh, I love working in Canada. Um, it's a very good place to shoot movies. And uh, in fact, this movie was prepared in Canada, it was shot in Europe mainly, and then it was post-produced in, in uh, Canada. So, and so it was, you know, it was like a co-production. So it was sort of it was a group effort of all of us. Another question here, and this will be the last one, folks. Okay, then. I have another question related in relation to uh, the Pirates of the Caribbean movies. Johnny Depp is coming up with two new movies. Is there any chance that we might see you in any of them? And what did you think about Penelope Cruz at having the pirate uh, character? What did, sorry, sorry, I didn't catch the last bit. Uh, Penelope Cruz doing oh, the part. Oh, right. Um, 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 no, I don't think I will do any more. Um, uh, you know, I said after the second one that that was going to be it as far as, you know, three. Um, I haven't seen the last one. I'm sure it's wonderful. I think Penelope Cruz is a wonderful actress. On that note, folks, <laughs> thank you very much for being here. Thank you. Congratulations. Thank you, Henry. Thank you.